No doubt about it. It's not only the English, it's not only the Portuguese, it's not only the French, it's not only the Spanish. There were a number of number of European powers who were aspiring for the same thing. These, these trading routes, the ancient trade routes are being renewed in the modern times. I hope so you acknowledge this fact. China is one of the main contenders. Because these weapons of mass destruction have that capability to destruct the entire earth, to take the earth into a negative spiral. Hello everyone. I welcome you all to this a very unique initiative of Mentors for IAS that is called as the Mains Powerhouse. I am here to guide you through uh, the, the portion, the, one of the static portion of our examination which, which is going to be expected in your GS1 paper, the world history part of it. The objective of this particular session is to give you an idea about what is world history, what are the dynamics of the world history, what are the boundaries of the world history, what is the manner in which you approach this particular subject. All right, with this, let us proceed further. Let us talk about world history, the requirement of the world history. How do you see this particular subject? My honest suggestion to you all would be that you would perceive this subject, the world history part of your UPSC main examination as a study of a transformation, right? You would ask, what is the transformation? As a transformation, that has been happening in the past, which can be subcat, which can be broadly put up, put forward in this in this format, a transition from a pre-modern world to the modern world. Of course, one question arises: What is this modern world or a pre-modern world? See, modernization basically refers to the process of the process that emphasizes process that emphasizes more on science and technology. The more the emphasis on innovation, science, technology, rationality right the more modern the world can be it, it can be perceived in that particular way so this transformation has been happening throughout the world throughout the world a generalized transformation a generalized transformation in some of the dynamics what have been listed over here is what you have to trace to put to put, put to put forward an example i would like to consider that the pre-modern world some let us say 10th century right ad uh, 15th century AD or a medieval or an ancient aspect. This is what is and what is uh, that I'm talking about. What do you think so was the political structure? The political structure in the pre-modern world was largely dominated by monarchy. I hope so you agree with this. Monarchy was the most dominant form of the government that was existing in the pre-modern world. Of course, it has its own flaws. The extent to which monarchy has its appeal today has drastically declined. Very few nations in the world is st still has monarchical form of the government, right? Because of its inherent flaws, the rulers can be despotic, the rulers can be autocratic, the rulers can uh, fulfill their will and wish. Of course, it all depends on the will and wish of the king. So that had its own that had its own limitation. So from the pre-modern world, there has been a transformation across the time, across space, across regions. There has been transformation in the political structure from monarchy to modern forms of government, such as modern ideologies, such as a democracy, isn't it? So there is a widespread understanding, widespread appeal today, or belief, rather I would call it, that democracy is the best form of the government, isn't it? That, that the manner in which democracy is being implemented, it might differ. There is parliamentary democracy. There are different forms of it. I'm not going into that, right? What am I? Focusing upon is that this transformation of ideologies, transformation of the political structure has happened in a pretty defined manner, has, has happened in, in a very predictable or a pattern. There is a pattern that, that is what you have to catch, right? Similarly, similarly, the, more, the economic prospects, the economic structure of the pre-modern world, you name the state, whichever region, whichever a uh, nation, whichever country comes to your mind, right, in the pre-modern era, that is in the ancient and the medieval era, the economy was very, very simple. If I go back in time, probably there was a barter system that was followed. Then some sort of monetary form, monetization happened, monetized, uh, monetized economy started coming into picture. And with increase in the world trade, probably there started emerging a number of currency. But today, the economy has assumed a very, very, very complex structure. And this complex structure is due to 
the interests of multiple states, multiple nations in order, you know, uh, to have that uh, the, to have that share of superiority, to have that share of economic strength. All right. And it is a very complex. It's not as simple as it was back then. Right. And in fact, as far as the society is concerned, as far as the society is concerned, don't you think so? The social structure of the social structure of many nations have been constantly changing. Yes. Can I can I can I give the credit to technology? Yes, one of the major share, or I mean, one of the major credit that that goes to is this transformation in the form of technology. All right, so you you are supposed to deal with you are supposed to deal with all this all this transformation, the manner in which it has happening, how it has uh, uh, how it has been executed in different parts of the world. There is a very simple standard structure, right? For example, let, this is this assumes very great importance. Back then, can you can you agree? with this fact that the society was dominated by the privileged section. Yes, there are a number of social order that existed. Feudalism is one among them, right? The privileged sections of the population started dominating the society. But today, what is the nature of the society? Can I say today the, so the society has largely assumed an egalitarian nature all right and all this is for the better for the better with time with the time right the nations have been transforming from a pre-modern setup to a modern setup and these transitions have been happening in different nations differently the rate at which this transformation happens differs that's the reason we have number of events happening around the globe uh you know at different time intervals right but the pattern what the manner in which it happens the transformation it happens is is probably uh, more or less similar and that is that is what something i would like to suggest that you have to catch those patterns and in fact uh, the rest of it is becomes easy most of the candidates who you know the, they have approached me world history is something that does not go into my mind history ancient history medieval history is something that does not go into my mind that is something that i cannot deal with is what uh, uh, is their main concern so i'd like to tell you i would like to tell you the answer to all of that concerns is you are not being able to catch these patterns. You are not able to catch these transfer, whatever the standard approach that it happens. Once you do it, once you are able to identify such patterns exist across time, right? You are readily predicting what is going to happen next. And in fact, it's just the events that has happened. It's just the names. It's just the places that changes. Right? Once you get this, history is going to be a cakewalk. All right. Let me proceed further. Let me proceed further. Let me go into an inquiry of the transition, which we just spoke about, the transition between the pre-modern world to the modern world, the patterns. I'm going to help you in catching some of the patterns today, right? So why is this? What are the main reasons for the transition of the pre-modern world to the modern world? Answer lies a simple solution for a simple reason, a simple uh, event that has shaped up this transition is the relationship between the East and the West. This east and the west the relationship existing between the east and the west is the defining factor of the transformations of the various nations from a pre-modern setup to a modern setup how let me tell you one of the basic relationship that the west and the east by west i mean the western hemisphere the western part of the world which largely in the pre-modern world uh, was centered around the European nations, all right? And in the East, I'm talking about the Indian subcontinent, the Southeast Asia and the South Asia. This is, and the Middle East, of course, cannot ignore Middle East over here. This relationship, this relationship was largely being regulated by trade. Yes. Anyone who has prepared for this particular examination, a simple, a simple uh, uh, information that you would be aware about is that spices, were the most dominant commodity that was being traded and there is a reason for it right the europeans considering their limited agricultural prospects required a lot of preservatives for their to store their food and that is the preservatives is what was available in the east the east was the storehouse of all these preservatives and as a result of which they depended their existence to a certain extent depended upon the east and there was trade and commercial activity Continuing, and you know, there are trade routes for the same purpose. There are a number of trade routes, a number of trade routes. The older ones, 
the ancient ones emphasis is being renewed on it and it are these these trading routes the ancient trade routes are being renewed in the modern times i hope so you acknowledge this fact china is one of the main contender who is actually renewing this ancient route so there are there is a lot of significance and remember i would like to reemphasize a dialogue between the past and the present this is what i mean this is the pattern that you have to catch right and now as long as this trading relation between the east and the west was running smooth no major conflicts no major conflicts was happening and of course ideologies it was a phase of movement of ideologies as well information rationality all right emphasis on reason and what not they used it used to you know the, the, these regions used to interchange all right then happens a very prominent event a very prominent event in the history of the world that has influenced the history of the world is the birth of islam in the 7th century ad the birth of islam as you all know the region what we call it as the middle east right witnessed the birth of islam a new religious ideology with the coming of prophet muhammad and after his death 632 a small dispute with this number but again this is the safe number to be assumed safe number to be taken right 632 ad the 7th century ad was was the century wherein this new aspirations have been emerging in this particular region now this new ideology that has been emerging this ideology or this uh, 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 region this part of the world which is again consolidate which is rising will aspire for resources will aspire for resources will aspire for that share of prosperity and what not and as a result of which as a result of which islam in 7th century to 10th century more or less dates are not important for us over here right but that does not mean that you you know to randomly put your own dates that's not what it is an approximate timeline if is what you remember that is going to be sufficient islam started consolidating in this 7th century to 10th century ad and after its consolidation naturally it started spreading in the 11th century ad now this spread of islam was perceived to be a threat among the westerners and as you all might be knowing the west was dominated by christianity mind it religion also today according to the communist ideology is a tool of exploitation and there is some degree of truth in it religion in the name of religion people can be exploited in the name of religion right money money can be can change hands a number of hands and we are all aware about it so this 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 development this new emphasis this new development in the world started a conflict between a started a conflict between the west and the east or middle east in the form of a tussle between the rising islam and that of the christianity manifesting itself in the form of crusade the holy wars the holy wars right you must be aware about this crusade now this crusade continued for considerable amount of time and of course what was the bone of contention the bone of contention was the trading route and a very crucial aspect of this east and the western trade is constantinople istanbul turkey the modern day turkey this this part of this part of uh, this part of the world was very crucial in order to uh, very crucial for for european countries to secure that share of spices to secure secure that share of uh, world trade at a very cheaper price then what happens next a very dominant event influencing the history of the world happened that is the conquest of constantinople 1453 was the time when the ottoman turks captured constantinople now please try to understand one thing now the relationship between the west and the east with islamized turks in between in a situation of deadly conflict between christianity and islam operating will naturally cause be a cause of concern to the west because now if the those set of goods those spices those goods whichever was you know which was needed for the west for the european countries which had to be passed through this particular trade route was naturally was naturally difficult because 
Ottoman, uh, Ottoman Turks, Islamized Turks have been capturing this particular place, which probably increased the price or increased the price of the commodities, right? Now, this is not feasible. This is definitely not acceptable to the European community at that point of time because, because spices is something that they rely upon. Spices is something is there. Uh, is, is something that, you know, they, they actually, their existence is depending at this particular moment. And that has been captured over here. So naturally, they will have to find some alternative or they will have to find some solution because this enhanced prices of the commodities is something that they cannot sustain for a very long period of time. All right. Emerging out of, emerging out of this, this phase, emerging out of this phase, there would be emphasis on rationality emphasis on geographical discoveries that is what we call it as the renaissance 10th century to 14th century ad europe was under what we call it as the dark age dark age era of superstition era of irrationality right probably this 14th century or 15th century was a very great wake up call for the europeans Especially after the capture of Constantinople, yes, we have to find out. There should be emphasis on education. There should be emphasis on scientific discoveries. There should be emphasis on geographical discoveries. So, it, it, you know, uh, 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 an informal technological revolution is what you can call this started happening. So this begins, this takes us to the era of revolutions. The world has seen a number of revolutions with this, right? With this comes geographical discoveries. You must be aware about the discoveries of 1492, the discoveries of 1498. This is purely with an intention to discover the East and establish a maritime trading route directly with the East so that they do not have to depend upon the constant Constantinople trading route. All right. So that is what led to their discoveries of the East, discovery of the maritime trade route to India and to the, in, to the East India, to the, to the Southeast Asia, right, that has cost all this developments all right now this developments has brought a lot of prosperity no doubt about it it's not only the english it's not only the portuguese it's not only the french it's not only the spanish there were a number of number of european powers who are aspiring for the same thing and with this of course comes in a lot of prosperity now they have found out a solution which gets them their traditional goods and the traditional commodities that they were they actually uh, uh, you know uh, wanted right at a very cheaper price right so naturally they do not stop at utilizing them they also go ahead with trading it so number of trading companies come up with it isn't it this is what we call it as the era of mercantilism mercantilism is that phase wherein every country was in the pursuit of uh, you know shifting those profits getting that wealth you know making their own nations a richer one that is the that was the emphasis now with prosperity with prosperity, economic prosperity, there will always be a question. There is always be a question on the political structure. I hope so you agree with this. If economic prosperity is secured by a particular country, naturally expectations of reforms, people's voice would come up naturally. People are securing themselves a share of livelihood securing for themselves uh, a good standard of living and naturally they cannot they cannot stay for a long period of time under absolute despotic rulers don't you think so yes that is what exactly has happened these are the revolutions are nothing but the stories the stories of transformation of the world political structure from monarchical forms of government into whatever they are today respectively and it has happened you can, the dates have been mentioned over here you can clearly visualize this Right, glorious revolution is a revolution that has happened in England. Right, James II has, you know, had to be had to be thrown out. Right, American revolutions is nothing but is nothing but the transformation of the American political structure. They did not want to remain under the supremacy of the England, and as a result of which, there has been a drastic transformation. By that, I would like to also point out that revolution is nothing but a drastic transformation that is happening in either political, economic, or societal structure, or more than one. Right. French Revolution, France decided not to remain under uh, under the despotic rulers, Russia, right? But the outcome is not always the same. Some countries which have undergone revolutions have accepted capitalism as their uh, political ideology, as the dominant political ideology. Some nations have accepted communism as their dominant ideology. Some nations have expected socialism and some has been, uh, you know, 
accepting religious ideologies as their dominant ideology. So the outcome is pretty much very different. That is mainly due to emergence of plenty full of ideologies. This world trade, this world trade, depending upon their prosperities, has brought up a debate on the political ideologies such as capitalism, communism. Once you go through into all, I would I would do a series on this ideologies of the world in the near future, right? But as of now, let me take you through further. These revolutions are nothing but a story of drastic transformation that has been happening from a pre-modern world to a modern world. That is in the form of monarchical form of the government to the modern democratic forms of the government, which is usually the case with certain exceptions. All right. And then as we proceed further, of course, Chinese revolution, Iranian revolution, these are also right. These are also the revolutions that has largely contributed taken together. It has contributed to the emergence of new world order. That would be capitalism. Probably it is communism. Socialism. And of course, monarchical form of government exists even in certain countries today. That's that's also the existing order. But what is my point over here? My point is my point that I would like to make over here is that these ideologies has been regulating the economic structure of course polity one of the informal definition of polity is that it is the guardian of economy the manner in which a nation's resources economic prospects economic future depends on what is the political structure so the countries that have you know that have been facing different problems and according to those problems they have accepted or adopted you know the appropriate order which suits them that is the story of rise of multiple nations and all obviously obviously this new world order this new world order this new world order, by this i mean the new ideologies that has been accepted has brought in a lot of prosperity and this prosperity can be attributed directly to the increasing share of those respective countries in the world trade. Right? For example, taken together, I mean, for example, English. They were a part of the geographical discoveries or they were part of the maritime trade. They colonized many countries, including India, and they implemented their ideology of mercantilism, followed by ideology of imperialism, where they started controlling the political structure in order to control the economy of that particular region of this particular region and as a result of it they started growing their they started growing in power they started uh, uh, you know the process of their economic prosperity now where is this economic prosperity going to be utilized please try to understand this economically empowered nations being the beneficiaries of this new world order will transform themselves in the form of industrialized nations. I hope so. You understand that with the time, with the prosperity, right? The country moves from a dominant primary sector to the secondary sector to the tertiary sector in this order. Exceptions are there. But my point over here is that this prosperity, the increased share of prosperity was utilized by many countries in the form of industrializing themselves increasing the manufacture potential so therefore there are industrial revolutions happening in different parts of the world it all began in 1750s in england industrial revolution begins in england industrial revolution begins from the cotton from the textile sector this is the standard pattern that has been happening right multiple countries france germany russia japan us number of countries number of countries who are part and parcel of this particular uh, 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 you know, the set of world share, whatever is happening, they have been get industrializing themselves. Is this good for the world? Definitely it's good for the world, but it has a negative consequences. What is the negative consequences? If you ask me, what is the requirement? What is the requirement? Basic requirement for an industrialized economy. Industrialized economy requires few basic things let me mark this number one it needs a constant supply of raw material second it needs a steady access to market and the third 
a steady inflows of capital, capital formation, in order to expand those industries. Right now, I'm not going into the basics of the economy or you know further deep into the economy. I'm going to take these parameters. These parameters will enable a country to industrialize themselves and to grow that to enhance their you know product, production power, production capacity, and you know get that prosperity. But the problem over here, the problem over here is that there is not one country that is aspiring for them. There are many industrialized nations that has been come up. For example, Germany, of course, Britain, France, US, Italy, the list can keep on going. Japan, Russia, of course, USSR, etc. The list can go on and on. If all of them, if all of these countries have a common aspirations, don't you think so there will be a conflict? Conflict for raw material, conflicts for markets, conflicts for this capital formation. Forget about capital formation. Let us focus on these two. If they want this set of uh, very standard supplies, secured supply of raw materials and constant access to markets, naturally they'll have to look outside of their own territories. And where would they look for? They would look for into the colonies. The colonies of some traditional powers like Britain. India is a colony, right? USA was once upon a time a colony. The United States of America later was formed, right? The North America was once upon under the supremacy of the Britain, right? So when number of countries having common aspirations, common aspirations of securing the source of raw material and markets, naturally there would be a conflict. This conflict, these conflicts, I would use the word, the plural word, these conflicts of these countries for the fight for, the tussle for, the struggle for raw materials and the source of market manifested itself in the form of the two great world wars. World War I and World War II. This is nothing but the story of the First World War and the Second World War. This is a war that was fought for colonies. This is the war that was fought for securing the source of raw material, no matter whatever is the stated objective. The inherent objective is this understanding what I'm trying to give it to you. All right. And of course, US did a very, 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 very very, very great thing, right? At least according to it, that the Second World War saw the world's witness the dropping of nuclear weapons, drop, dropping of the atomic bombs over Japan. That created a very, uh, very strong, strong opposition to the use of nuclear weapons because it is not only about the, the, the nations that are into the conflict or the nation that is at the receiving end or the nation that is, you know, dropping these bombs. It is about the world. It is about the entire world because these weapons of mass destruction have that capability to destruct the entire earth, to take the earth into a negative spiral. So naturally, there was widespread opposition. The widespread criticism brought in a new strategy, a new strategy of conflict, right? The most powerful, the most powerful or, you know, the most victorious powers that emerged after the Second World War is United States of America on one side and the other power block, USSR. So naturally, conventional, traditional warfare is definitely was not expected or would, would, be, would not be appreciated. There would be interference from so many powers. As a result of which, the Cold War, as a mode of warfare, as a mode of warfare began. Right? So that is the story. There are a number of, the number of events happening between this and Cold War is a war that is naturally, you know, fought not in the convention style, but, you know, uh, but as, as, as a war for uh, dominating supremacy, as a war for, you know, dominating the world by, by showcasing their supremacy in the form of uh, weapons, in the form of technology, in the form of allying. And of course, it is always a third party conflict. You know, these two powers did not did not uh, attack, did not attack each other, did not attack uh, 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 directly each other, or definitely this war was fought, fought on the third party front. So therefore, this event uh, has number of subcategories, which is spanning right from the post Cold World War II, the post World War II, until the collapse of USR, USSR, until the collapse of USSR, until one broke down. All right, and hence that established the hegemony of USA 
into the present world. That is what you know. And with this, I would like to conclude. Another most important aspect, honest advice to you, is that another most important aspect, why you need to emphasize sufficiently enough on world history is that this gives you a very good base, a very good base for understanding and another dimension of your GS paper too, that is international relations. International relations is that subject that relies very heavily on historical underpinnings. What was the relation? What is the event that has shaping up these relations? This particular multilateral organization is the outcome of such a so and so event that has been happening. And that is all of the information is what you would get in studying this world history. Of course, please try to dedicate sufficient amount of time to this particular subject because the the fringe benefits of studying or giving importance to world history is 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 a lot all right both in gs paper one as well as gs paper two you will find sufficient amount of questions that will have uh, that will expect you to know a background on this particular subject in order to score good marks in your considering that you know gs plays a very important role also right you have to please focus on each and every dynamics but you have to be very smart in your preparation. You need not follow the conventional approach that has to be uh, followed for studying history. So please be smart enough, catch some of the patterns, and I would be coming up with another uh, sessions which will help you to make your uh, preparation very productive. With this, I would like to take a leave. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope so. You study well. Happy preparation. And I would like to end this session by quoting our very famous slogan, Isbar, Mainspar. Thank you so much.